How are you? Isn't it good to come to church on Sabbath? You know, as a literary evangelist, as I go to the doors and we go there and knock on doors and talk to people, you know what a lot of people would love to do in their life? Most of them? Is to go to church. <laughs> you know, it's funny, and they, they're not really what we would call church people. You know, they have... They, have, uh, they still want to carry on with their habits and stuff and the way they live. But, you know, a lot of them said, oh, I'd love to go to church. You know, I wish I could go to church. I wish I was, had a church to go to. Comments like that. So, you know, we are a privileged lot. But we're not here just to warm the pews, are we? Many churches have been risen up and are around about us. And what are they there for? Has God risen them up? Yes, he has. Earlier on, he did. But his idea of this was to be one church at the end of time, ready to receive Jesus to come back. Is that true? One church. But as we are humans, we want to do our own thing. But Seventh-day Adventists, we are not a church, a Sunday church, keeping Sabbath or coming to church on Sunday. We have been given a commission. Of all the churches, we have given the, been given the final commission to take to the world. And some of our hymns have uh, alluded to that this morning. In Revelation 18, it talks about in verse 1, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, an angel, it's not a literal angel, it's you and I. I believe, as, it, as it's spoken in our church, that that verse does speak about our publishing work. As uh, the publishing area manager in New Zealand, I'd like to say to you that the work is not finished yet. And God is still calling for people. The greatest dilemma that we have in this world is of people and uh, men and women who are willing to go out there and tell the people out there that Jesus has died for them and loves them. We are challenged with that. As literal evangelists go there to the doors, we often have the opportunity to talk to people. So, And you know, they seem to relieve. There are thousands out there wanting to know that very answer in their life, that Jesus loves them. They don't actually know it's that, but when you tell them. For example, I was with a literal evangelist in Hamilton just last week. And we were canvassing and we came across this young guy, his name was Neil. And he was 29 and he was going to uni, he was doing a, a PhD and sort of social, he, he tried to explain it to me but I couldn't really understand it. But it was something like he was looking at current events, what was happening. And he wanted to, to uh, research some of the things, why these things were going on and who was behind all the, the falseness that was in our parliaments, in our governments and our big companies, drug companies, you name it, all these conspiracies going on. And he wanted to research it. He was warned off not to research the oil companies. He said this is before the big spill and he was wanted to research the, these oil companies, who's behind them, what's the purpose of this, and, and they were told him not to do it because they would come down upon him if he researched and found things and started to publish it. So he took another direction. But he's, as I said, are you a Christian? And he said, no, I'm a confessed atheist. And I said, what you are telling us is exactly, Christians know that already. You're going to do a PhD for finding these things out. But most Christians in my church know what, what you, you're alluding to and what you're aiming for. He said, what? How do they know that? I said, it's in the Bible. It's been there for years. And then we told him a little bit about it. He said, well, in the end, when we left, he said, this is his words. His words were saying, you know, I think people need to get closer to God. <laughs> a confessed atheist. I praise God for that. And we walked away and left him with great controversy. What a powerful book that is. In, in uh, a book that we read as literal evangelists on a regular basis, because we enjoy it, it's written for us and you, but we, we uh, capitalize on it. It says that, Expecting great things. It's not the capabilities you now have or ever will have that will give you success. And that brings us all down to earth, doesn't it? 
I mean, some of us are professionals in, in, the, in the church here. Some of us are laborers. Some of us don't do anything. Some of us are students and kids. But this brings us all on the level playing field, as they say. Nothing will give us success. It says, is that which the Lord can do for you? We need to have far less confidence what man can do and far more confidence what God can do for every believing soul. Now, that's what we need to believe in, that God can do it. Look, if we are here today believing that we are Seventh-day Adventists and we've been called here and we have been called out of the world to be here and then we think we've got to go out and do things out there to tell people about Jesus Christ, we've got to do it. We've missed the boat. We've just got to volunteer and walk out there. Jesus will do it. The Holy Spirit will do it. Ask literal evangelists what happens when they go to the doors. We have no control over that. We don't know what's behind the door. And they don't know who we are. And when we go in there, we knock on the door and go in and we do our work and we're selling them. They interrupt us and ask us ask about God sometimes. Now, why would they want to do that when I'm talking about health books? One day I knocked on a door and I came across this, these, this old lady. She came out and she was very old and she said, uh, hello, Sonny, and I told her what I was doing. And she said, well, come in. And I, okay, thank you, I said. And as I came in, I said, oh, uh, you live alone now, nowadays? Are you or your husband? She said, oh, no, I've never married. But I oh, know I don't live alone. I said, oh, yeah. She said, I live with my mother. <laughs> I said, big pardon? She said, I live with my mother. I said, oh, I didn't think they made them that old. <laughs> she was old. And then when I got to her mother, she, she was old. You know, <laughs> relic, nearly. Um, she, she was sitting in a chair, something like this. I never forget it, and it was, but it was raised, had longer legs, because the old girl couldn't bend the knees to any, you know, beyond the point she would. So she used to just plonk in it about here, and she sat. She looked like a king, queen, or you know, she sat there, and she had the the old time here, you know, they used to, um, had, she had long hair, obviously, and they bunned it up somehow. You know how they bun it up there, and it sort of wraps it around the back of her head somehow, and she was up there, and she was like this, no smiling, no expression on her face. And, and her daughter brought me in and introduced me, and uh, mother didn't move, just looked at her. I reckon what it might have set in, but she was looking, and she's sitting there. And so I, a bit nervous, and made a bit of um, small talk to, to build the bridge in, and then I began my canvas. Now, I was selling family medical care health books, and I started to do the canvas. You know, I was a new literature evangelist, relatively, a couple of years, and I was doing the demonstration, doing a good job, I thought. Next minute, out of the... This old granny she yells out, stop, 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 stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She says, we don't need health books. She said, she's over 80 and I'm over 100. What do we need health books for? I mean, have we got it right? I mean, do we need it now? I'm thinking, well, <laughs> you might have a point there. <laughs> I was only doing my job, you know, so I'm thinking, oh, I think, oh yeah, well. That's true. I said, I had to admit that. And so I backed down and I pulled out Today, Tomorrow and You, which is a book we come with, it, Your Bible and You, lovely book by Arthur Maxson. And I started to demonstrate that and I said, well, this is one that everyone needs, no matter what age. And I started to go through. Arthur Maxson talks about the Bible and how it works in your home, your life and family. And I was going through that. Next minute, stop, 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 stop. I said, what? There's no God. We don't believe in God. And I said, a classic, this is what uh, literary evangelists are taught to say. Apparently you have some reason for feeling that way. I'm going to ask what it is. <laughs> and that's the, that's the professional way of asking the, them to give you a reason why they said no. And so she said, uh, 30 years ago, she said, my son, a beautiful man, a lovely man, he was out on the beach and he was swimming. And this young, frivolous little thing, just walking around in a Reef McKinney, showing herself off to everyone. She went out into the surf and she was flitting around there and she got into trouble. No one went to save her. My son went to save her and did save her, but he drowned doing it. You can't tell me there's a God when he would take a lovely boy like that from me. And this thing, this woman who should have drowned for what she was doing, lived. No, there's no God. 
And I'm sitting there, and because she's talking with authority, this this queen of on this chair, and she was going looking at me and frowning. And I and I was praying. I said, Lord, what am I going to say to this lady? She said, Double the years of my experience. <laughs> what am I going to say? And the words came out of my mouth. Now, you know, normally when we speak, it usually goes through the grey matter somehow, doesn't it? You know, like we sort of make our mind up what we're going to say, isn't it? Well, I didn't have any 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 um, thing in it. It just came out of my mouth. And I said, why are you still alive? And she said, what? And I had to repeat it. Why are you still alive? Because we come from good stock. That's what she said. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, um, your son. Uh, I said, if he is a good boy, like you say, I said, um, and it was a heaven, you know, and it was a heaven and God. And if he was a good boy, where would he be? Would he be in hell? Would he be in purgatory? Or would he be, she'd be, he'd be up in heaven, she said. He'd be in heaven. He's a good boy. Said, oh yeah. So if if he's in heaven, and you know, if he is if he is a heaven, he's there. And you don't believe in a God, and you don't believe in heaven. Well, obviously, you'll never see your son. You've missed him for thirty years, and you'll never see him. Do you think that uh, possibly God is keeping you alive till you change your mind because He wants to, you to see his son, your son? She's sitting there, and the hands were going like this. And then the daughter jumped in, and she said, "How much is that book?" And I said, <laughs> and I said, it's $58. And she said, oh, can we pay a deposit? Yes. And I wrote out a deposit. And the mother was there like, and, and so I wrote the order and I shot through, got out the door. I'm walking out the gate um, and I just left, I was coming back in a month and I, I was walking out the gate and I thought, oh, what did I say that for? How, I haven't got the right to say that to that lady. I should apologise. I can't, it's terrible. And I turned around and then I got scared. I thought, mm, <laughs> she's an old girl, you know. <laughs> I said, maybe I'll apologise when I come back to deliver the book. So off I went. And when I come to deliver, a month's time, I'd forgotten the, the address and I knocked on the door until the door opened the, the door and I realised where I was. And she says, oh, that's OK. She's not here. I said, oh, phew. She says, come in. So he come in. She, and I said, look, I must apologise to your mother. I'm so sorry that I've said that. And she says, oh, no, 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 don't do it. She said, it's the best thing ever happened. I said, why? She said, when you left. So I told her I was going to apologise when I left. She said, oh, you're lucky you didn't come back in. But she said... Uh, she said, when you left, she said, how dare he talks to me like that in my home? Who does he think he is coming in here talking to me like that? And she was really angry. But she said, when, she said, uh, when is that book coming? And, and, uh, and I, she told her a month. She said, don't you read it before I read it. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, that's all right. She said, I said, well, where is she today? And she said, well, she's down at the church hall. She's been going to church three times now. She's gone to church three times. She's down there helping them with their faith day. So I said, well, praise the Lord, you know, she paid the deposit went out. And I realised then that I had nothing to do with that because nothing went through here. I never thought of that. Who did, who did that for me? Because God cared about this old lady more than what I had to do. And I do believe that God is calling all of us to do something. Let us turn our Bibles, if you've got your Bible, over to a story that I want to tell you about. And it's John 9. If you go to, the, to John 9... Gospel of John. Now, this is a this is an interesting story because you think what this happened in the story here, anyone could do that. Hello, Stuart. There you go. <laughs> um, anyone could do this, and and why didn't Jesus do it himself? But he didn't. And I've got a thing in here. I'll just right. Now we have all seen beggars. Oh, well, no, sorry, you haven't. Who's seen a beggar? Who's been a beggar? <laughs> Who wants to be a beggar? Good experience. Sometimes when I'm a cold porter, I think I am a beggar. <laughs> but um, this is just a photo. But in, I was in uh, PNG for 10 years, and we had beggars over there, blind beggars and, and all sorts of beggars. And uh, they used to know you. There's a blind guy outside Anderson's um, uh, general store. And when I used to go there and I'd pull up my truck, I didn't know this guy. He had a name, a, a biblical name. I forget that, what it was, but let's say it's, you know, I don't know, Paul or something like that. But uh, he, he was there. And, and I used to drive up and I'd walk in there and he would say, G'day, Brian, how are you going? And, and he's blind, sitting there, and he didn't know me. I didn't know him, but he knew me. And so I said, oh, G'day, how are you going? And, uh, you know, obviously he needed some money, so I'd, I'd chuck him a keener or two. 
and then I'd go in. And he knew me every time. And even when I parked my car around the corner and I walked past him, he, he knew my walk in something. And he said, hello, is that you, Brian? I said, yes. Two, you know, two kings. And, and this is what he was. And I said, how did he know this? But, you know, when you've got no eyes, your ears are really good and your senses are good. And he knew. He said, who's that white man? You know, because you could tell, you know, a white man walks in the island fields. Anyone been there, you know? White man walk, boom, 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 boom. Island guys, drift along and so they knew when we walked boom 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 you know and uh, he found out who I was now this uh, story talks about when Jesus come out of the out of the um, temple there was a young guy sitting against a wall like that and he was um, a beggar he was blind and he'd been blind since his birth and then Jesus looked at him as he came out now when you when you when you are with people that are very high up and wealthy or you know though you've seen them if any one of those people around them when 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 a king or a queen looks at somebody all the people around them look where they're looking it happens i was in a department store in bangkok once and the sister of the of the king came in anyone had to leave the store and i'm out there and um, I'm, the, I'm buying some batteries and but i was a white man so they said well you can stay but well, you don't have to do anything and and i and they said, I said, why? I said, well, this is the princess coming on. And I got my camera out, you know, trying to do it. No, no, please. And this guy just about fell on the ground begging me, please don't take a photo. Please don't take a photo. I'm not allowed to. You know, apparently, I'm not allowed to do that. So I watched it. But she would look and saw and she would stop to look at a hat or something. All the thing would look at the hat, you know. And then, they, and then she would move on and they would be talking to her and then she'd stop looking at me and look at that. And when Jesus looked at this man, his disciples looked at Adam. And that's why they asked the question. They said, in verse 2, they said, um, Rabboni, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples knew this guy was born blind. They didn't, you know, they didn't say, oh, you know, he had an accident and was blind. They knew this guy. He'd been sitting there for years. And the thing is that when beggars get a position, they hold it really strongly. In New Guinea, you, you know, when, when two beggars, when another beggar comes onto the ground, his ground where he was begging, and he finds out there's a real big of a fight. And, and they are, they're really into each other. And sometimes everyone stands around and watches. It's a bit of a, a joy and a bit of a sideline. Thing. Everyone watches them laughing and carrying on. It's so funny to watch them fighting and you try and walk in there and break them up, you know, and everyone sort of, oh, boo, boo, you know, let them go. But, you know, it's funny. It's hard to do seeing a blind guy trying to punch someone and, you know, he doesn't know where it is and the other guy's got one leg and he's hopping around. It's sort of, it's, it's funny in some ways. But, but the thing is that they really you know, really want to keep their ground because that's where they get their money. And this guy here was sitting outside the temple. And we know why he got that position. And so when he was there, Jesus turned around and he said, verse 3, he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, there's a miracle coming up, isn't there? We know the story. And he said, Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day, because night is coming when no man can work. And those words, I apply to us today. You've heard them today. You'll have no excuse, and I'll tell you now that I've told you, you'll have no excuse in the future ever to say, I didn't have time. I didn't know. I didn't realise that I had to do something. Because now today, you've heard those words. All of us have heard them. And then it said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, is Jesus in the world today? I mean, you know, literally in the world, is he? Come on, put, who's, who saw him? I mean, who's seen Elvis? Who's seen Jesus in the world? No one, because he's not here, is he? Where is he? He's in heaven with his father. So if he said, I'm the light of the world, I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, now that he's gone, is there no light in the world? Is it the world in darkness? Well, you could think so with what's going on, but... Who is the light of the world now then? Come on, who is? Yes, we are. You are, me are. We are. We are the light of the world. But he said, well, I'm not. So then he said these things. He spat on the ground, made a little, put it on the guy's eyes and said, go wash. I think I've got the right one here. He just touched the eye, guy's eyes and said, go and wash in the pool. And the guy goes off. He knows where that pool is. 
Jesus didn't say, well, you know, you've got to go down there and turn left and right. The guy knew where it is because people went down there to bathe, to wash, clean. New Guinea, you know, like we were there. You know, it's like, it's like biblical times over there. They wear dust and sandals and long things and they sit in the markets just like that. It takes you back. When you read the thing in scripture, it's so much real alive. And there's a lot of those countries around the world today. It's very much so. And when he washed, he had eyes he could see. Now, I reckon a young boy like that, after being blind since birth, and he was of age, he was, you know, 21, or we could say, but I'll say in those days he was 30. And he could see. How would he find his way home? How would he get home? I mean, if you were blind all your life and your eyes opened up, you wouldn't know where you were, would you? Would you? You wouldn't recognise any buildings, any cars, any trees. You might recognise a few sounds. You might recognise a few noises. But then when your senses come awake, everything else dulls off. But I reckon he had to shut his eyes to find his way home. And he would have found that section and been right there and gone home. Now, who would he have gone to see first up? Who would you tell? If you were born blind, blind all your life and you could see, who would you go and see first if you lived at home? Hey? Mum and Dad? Mum, anyway. <laughs> you go home and say, look, I can see. What joy it would have been in that household. What joy and happiness. And it says here in verse um, 9, some said, others said, it is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, this is his neighbours. Verse 8, therefore his neighbours and those who previously had seen him that he was blind said these things. Verse 10 says, therefore they said to him, how is it that you opened your eyes? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay anointed my eyes and said to me, go and wash in the pool. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. Because he was blind at the time, wasn't he? He didn't know what Jesus looked like. He wouldn't be out there. All these guys down there, he said, which one is it? He wouldn't know. And, and he, he, he just didn't know. Now, it was the Sabbath when this happened and the Pharisees also asked him when he went there because he had to go and see them. And that's a... That's a Levitical law, that if you have a healing, you must appear yourself in front of the Sanhedrin to see that you get their blessing, that it's a miracle from God. And so he turns up to them. And the Pharisees asked him again, and they said, um, verse 15, and the man said, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I could see. He didn't say Jesus, did he? Why didn't he say Jesus did that? He didn't. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not of God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was division amongst them, which there always is. And they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. Is he a prophet? Oh, sorry. He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him and they had that he had been blind and that he received his sight until they called his parents. Now, this man had been sitting outside the temple all his life and you tell me the Pharisees did not know that he was blind and didn't believe him. It just doesn't stack up, does it? In a court of law, it would just not, not stack up. This is in his hometown. They knew him. They knew who he was. Because we were coming down, they got his parents to come in. And they asked him. And his parents answered, verse 20. And they said, we know that this is our son. That's a truism. And that he was born blind. Another truism. But of what means he now sees, we do not know. And who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. Now, that last bit, I reckon it was all lies. Because, you know, that son had gone home and told his parents. And they would have been joyous for a while until they realised that the income that he makes sitting at that temple is really good money. Because the Jews used to love to come by and they would drop their money in long so make 
people drop bang, 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 and everyone eyes look when they see it. Oh, what a righteous man he is, giving all that money for Paul buying for it. You know what it's like when you're in a in a shop or somewhere and you drop money on the floor. Someone drops money and it goes ding, 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 ding. What does everyone do? Everyone looks around, don't they? Oh, look, it's sort of something of a sound that just tracks our ears and our attention, no matter what's going on. Money, noise of money. They do. And his parents said these things. And he said, his parents said these things, verse 22, that they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that anyone who confesses that he, is Jesus, is the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. His parents were going to the synagogue. They didn't want to be chucked out. It's a big thing to be in church on Sabbath. It's important to be in that group. And they didn't want to be cast out of that. So they decided they weren't going to say anything. Verse 23. Therefore the parents said, ask him. Verse 24. So they again they called the man who was blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And the man said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know is that though I was blind, I now see. When they said to him, what did he do? And how did he open your eyes? Now this young man, you remember, he's never been in the church. He's always sat out on the outside. He's never been in. So he doesn't know how to talk to these people. The Sanhedrin sitting up front because it's a big thing, this is. And they're all there. And this young man standing in front. And he says to them, this is how he speaks to them. He said, verse 27, I told you already and you do not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Pretty rude, isn't it? That's not the way to speak to very important people. But he spoke that way. Because that's what they needed to hear. Then they reviled him and said to him, You are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. And, they, and we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, who, who, uh, we do not know where he is from. And the man answered. Now, they don't know where he's from. But you know, Jesus was going around in Jerusalem there and he was preaching. And it's a fact, if you read in Leviticus, that a man cannot get up and preach at the pulpit here unless he's 30 years old and over and he's being given a proven by the Sanhedrin. He cannot do it. Just like I couldn't do it if I didn't have to arrange to come here. No one just stands up here unless it's been okayed. And they said they don't know where he's from. And no one stands up in the Jewish line unless they know where you're from who your parents are, where you were born. and everything. They knew he was born in Bethlehem, but they said you came from Nazareth. They knew, and Jesus knew they knew, but they denied it, so they didn't want to acknowledge that he was the Messiah and all the things he was doing. We don't know of him. And this is what the man says to him in verse 30, the young man. He says, why, this is a marvellous thing, that you do not know where he's from. You know, he's sort of really... You're making fun of them, really, I think. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshipper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opens the eyes of one born blind. If this man is not of God, he could do nothing. What a sermon. What a sermon. Who would have the, the gumptions to stand up in front of the Sanhedrin and say that? I bet the disciples wouldn't. And obviously his parents weren't. But this young boy did because he didn't know the etiquette. And you know what they said to him? Verse 34. You were completely born in your sins and you are teaching us. And they cast them out. Now, where did that theology come from that disciples said at the beginning? Who was in, whose fault was it? Was it his parents or him? Where did that theology come from? came from the Sanhedrin, came from the church of the day. They had taken scripture out of context and they said, that boy must have been born blind and sat on the wall there because he was a sinner for some reason. Not his parents, because his parents were in church. They must have been good. 
They couldn't have been the sinners. So obviously, it was a known fact that this boy's, it was his fault, not his parents. That's terrible. You know, some of us, sometimes we think, you know, these things happen to us because we're not doing the right thing according to God. You think God works like that? I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I was a good Catholic boy until my mother died. And then I wanted to know where she was. And I insisted, where is she? And I chased the priest around in this, this um, cup of tea time after a funeral. Where is she? Where is she? Come on, tell me where she is. You guys know. Where is she? I was 18. And he kept on saying, oh, you know, it's in God's hand. God looks after it. And I said, come on, you guys know. I want to know where she is. Because, see, my mother was married before the war. She had two daughters. And her husband... He was unfaithful and he moved away. He was in a big band in those days. They played big band in, in concerts. And that's where my mother met him because she used to do the can-can and all that sort of stuff. And then her father owned a hotel in Greytown. And during the war, her and her two sisters were the barmaids in that hotel. And her father was Stan Bryce. Six of Bryce, as the cricketers know him in New Zealand, he captain New Zealand many times, and he retired into Greytown and bought a hotel. And when my father came home from war, he went across the road for a drink, met my mother, and they fell in love. And they wanted to get married, and the church says, no, nah, not in our backyard, you won't. So they went down to, up to Marsden, and they got a registration marriage. And so then they had five of us. But the church said, hey, don't hold that against your kids. You've got to send them all to our school and church. So we did. We all went. They were good people, my parents. They were obedient, both Catholics, very obedient. And they did it even for themselves, though. They couldn't receive the sacraments. So they were there. And my mother never received the sacraments. And as they, I was taught as a kid from right up that unless you receive the sacraments, confession, communion, you cannot enter heaven. That's why at 18 I wanted to know where my mother was. I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth sort of thing. And then the priest, my sisters and brothers were saying, shut up, Brian, leave him alone. It's not the time to talk about it. I said, that is the time. He's still in, just put in the ground. So the priest finally turned around and said, you need to pray for your mother's soul to get her out of purgatory. And that was the last time we went to the church. I said, you've lost me. I said, that's what you say you do. And that's the God that you serve. And that's where she is. That's where God's put her. I don't want anything to do with him. And so at 18, I never went to church again. And at 18, I was playing rugby and going to church on Sunday. But that was the end of it. And it wasn't until I was 29, and I had my own children, and they asked me, Daddy, who is God, who is Jesus? And I had to make a decision. What do you do when your kids ask you that? As a parent, you have a responsibility. His parents in this story had a responsibility. What did they do? They let his son down. Wouldn't have been a great thing if they would have stood one either side of their son and said, this is our son, and this is what happened, and then backed him up in the story. Wouldn't it have been great? I hope we, none of us ever are found like these two, these parents, to this boy. But they kicked him out. And I searched the scriptures. I searched the Bible. I thought, that's what I'll do. And I'll find out myself and I'll tell you to my girls. And that's why in the searching, I found the truth. Praise the Lord. But here, his parents never said anything. They pushed him out there and says, you're old enough to do it yourself. And they kicked him out. And verse 35 says, And Jesus heard they have cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? You see, we're in synagogues. We've got synagogues at school. We've got synagogues at work. We've got synagogues in our family sometimes, in our homes, in our neighbourhood. We do not talk about Jesus. There's certain things we never mention. We never admit that we're Christians. We just let it slip. And when someone tells a joke at work, we laugh too. We're all guilty of that. What God is saying to us is that we need to be like this boy. And we need to come out and just be who we are and admit who we are. And be brave. That's half the problem. And that's the, when, when literal evangelists get over that, they can go out the doors any day. Because they have a message to give. But look, if you get put out of your synagogue because you stand up for Jesus... Look what happens. Jesus comes and looking for you. He will find you. In verse 36, the young boy answered, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, You both have seen him, and it's him who is talking to you. 
There is another person in the scripture that we may um, remember. Let me just do that. Oh, I've lost him. This lady here. She, she was a spiritual woman. She was coming to the well in the middle of the day. No one does that. It's too hot. It's silly. Even New Guinea don't do that. They go in the morning and the evening. But she's going in the middle of the day. Why? Because I believe she was a righteous woman. She was a good lady. She was most probably the most righteous lady in the whole village. And she was doing it to avoid a conflict between the other women who are at the well. Jesus was at the well. Why? Why was he there with the disciples way up in, in the country? Because there was a dispute going on in Jerusalem between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, and, and the Pharisees were trying to get one against the other. Just like the devil comes in here, tries and gets you against your fellow church members sometimes about theology or doctrines. And people will come in your church and pit one of you against the other. We'll start rumours. And it's a common thing in Adventist churches. And it was common in Jesus' day. And Jesus said, instead of trying to confront it and conflicting, because it was just not worth the argument, that's what they wanted, he said, we're out of here. And they went for a walk right up to Samaria. And so when Jesus met her, there was two people here avoiding conflict because their, their souls were kindling. And when he spoke to her and told her the things he did in the story, and you can read it, it's a great story, she knew then and saw hope. Then the disciples come back. She goes to a village. She leaves the pot and she goes back to the village. And she says, come, tell. There's a man that knows everything about me. Now these men are sitting around because the harvest is not right, ready yet. And that's what happens in the PNG even. Men don't do that much work. The women are the ones who keep the economy going. And they were sitting around. Now when she said, come and see a man who told me anything about me, they didn't hesitate. They got up and followed her. Now, if she was an unrighteous, if she was a harlot, as some people think she is, what do you think some of those men would say? I mean, she had five husbands, and she was the one she was living with wasn't a husband anyway. But they never flinched because I believe she was a righteous woman. They knew how good she was. They all got up. I suppose if I was one of her husbands, I'd be saying, oh, I'd like to see that. I was her husband, so if he's talking about her, what do I ever do? So he would have come. But otherwise, you know, if she was an unrighteous woman or she was a harlot, they would have said, oh, go and tell someone who cares, you know. Get out. Who would believe you? No one said that. They followed her. And she came, brought them down to Jesus. Jesus was talking to the disciples and they were saying, what do you need uh, this woman for? What were you talking? You need food? And, all that. and Jesus said, look, food, I may have to eat. You don't even know anything of. And then he says, some reap and some sow. He said, you were reaping from things you didn't sow. And he referred to them back to Jerusalem of John's disciples. John and his disciples, were what they did and the work that they did, the dis Jesus' disciples were baptizing people from John's work. And so he was giving them a lesson that you don't think you baptize more than John because it's all the same. They came. And you, what you and I do in this church, we're seeing people in the in the, come into the church and find Jesus. So that's what Jesus told them. And then she was coming. He said, you think it's three months before the harvest. Lift your eyes. The harvest is ripe. And I say to you today, I go to the doors with the litter evangelists, and the litter evangelists go to the doors, and we see people there, and the harvest is ripe, but there's not enough reapers. We, we have an interest. There's no one to follow us up. Sometimes there is, sometimes I let him go. It is a, it's a heart-rendering thing. And Jesus said, lift your eyes. And as they lifted their eyes up, as he pointed, here comes this woman down into the, where the well is with bringing the whole town. And they said to her later, you know, they believed because she told them. But then they said to the woman, look, we don't only believe that he is the Christ now because you told us, but we have seen for our own eyes. And that's what you will do when you go out there and talk to people. They'll say, yeah, what you said is good, but I've studied in the Bible and I believe it myself in my heart. That's our prayer. And Jesus says here to finish off, he says, verse 39, 
For judgment I have come into the world, for those who do not see may see, and that those who, may, who see may be made blind. And then the Pharisees round by, hanging around, says um, to him, are we, blind? are we also blind? Are we blind also? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Be very careful. We say that we see. In other words, we know the truth. You see? Those who people out there who, who are blind, they are blind to truth. They have no sin. God wants us to go out and talk to them. Yes, we, we can condemn them. We can judge them and say they're doing the wrong thing. Some of them will say they judge themselves. I'm doing the wrong thing. What else is there to do? But they are not condemned. Because they are blind. But we see. Because we're being given the sight. The light of the world. And for us not to do it. And for us to do the wrong thing. It is sin for us. And that's what God is saying. And we often think. Well how do we handle this? And the deacons of those that got those little pamphlets. Can you just start giving them out now please? In, in uh, this book that I like. There's Cold Porter Ministry it's called. It says a thousand ways. It says our heavenly father has a thousand ways. To provide for us which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making service of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before them. Jesus has the world in his hands. He's the one that controls all this. You don't have to do something. He's saying, just do what I, I ask you to do and I will do the rest. Now, I've got a little clip here. Um, am I able to play that clip? Oh, sorry, can't play a clip. But it was, it was a little clip um, from Danuta Marcos, one of uh, Litra Vandis I had in Sydney when I was there, who had 35 interests, and they were her customers. And the Lord really blessed Danuta. And what she was doing is that she was going and spending a lot of time talking to them when I got there. No wonder she wasn't selling as much as she could be. But she's baptising people in fours and fives, you know, every couple of months from her customers. And, you know, she started the work. So someone gave her this book, Cold Porter Ministry. On the, on the little leaflets being passed out, on the back of it, there are some boxes to tick. Praying for Litter Evangelists. We need your prayers. When I came to New Zealand two years ago, the team was at only eight Litter Evangelists in New Zealand. We had 28, 38 here at one time. I don't know what's happened. But God is calling them to buy missionary materials for them. Sometimes they can give out things for you. You might be able to help them there to supply them. The Like a Mighty Army lesson. This is a tremendous lesson. And by doing this course, you can see how the publishing can works in the community. How you may have a part in it. You don't have to take it, but some people say, this is great course, but the work is not for me. Others say, I believe God spoke to me as I did this course. Becoming a part-time literature evangelist in a team. Learn to conduct book parties and to follow up literature evangelists. Tick one of those or more of those boxes and please give it to me as I go out. Where you can support us. If you have an interest, that you want to serve God in the community, this church offers you this. This very thing. And I'd like to ask John if he would come forward and sing a song that we a theme song that we've had at our congresses over the time. Because even though we are maybe not um, doing a missionary type work, sometimes as we go along we, we, we have hard times, all of us. But God is giving us a promise. Sing with me if you know it. It's uh, Chuck Fulmore's great little song, uh, Never Give Up. There are days I know when you get so discouraged, it seems that all hope is gone. But there's one, only one, who can give. This old world I 
my encouragement to you. Never give up searching for a way that you need to serve the Lord. Wherever you are, God has got a position. He's chosen you to serve where you are. You don't have to go to the ends of the world. You don't have to be a missionary to New Guinea or anywhere else. You're a missionary right where you are. This town is in need of you, in need of us, to go and tell them. Not to get them in the church. They, they wouldn't fit in, would they? But to tell them about Jesus so they can make a decision. Like this young man. What was the miracle that we saw here today when we in that story? What was the miracle? That he received a sight? No. That was just a by sight. Jesus loves people. He helps them. The miracle was he stood in front of the Sanhedrin and he told them what they t he told them because Jesus couldn't do it. He said that the glory of God would be in him, didn't he? And not, not in his eyes, but in him. And he stood there and he stood before a, a captured audience. Those Sanhedrin, not one of them in, in the time of judgment, will say, I didn't know. And you and I can be a physician. You may be put before kings and governors before them. And that's where you need to be. And I praise the God that he'll give you a way to do it. That you will see and search your heart that you can do and serve for him. Let us uh, sing our, our final song, 248. Sweet by and by. Thank you. David, a literary evangelist of many years. Good to see you. He's still one of your good church members here. Still working. Yeah, still working, doing it. And Jocelyn, very good. And John and June, you have some people here that do the work and part-time, full-time. So I pray, Lord, that um, we can still add to our team. the song people that are just right now wishing that they knew what to do with their lives and what to do in their lives and whether you are really real that you are caring for them help us to go and tell them help us to be more bold where we are in our workplace at school and in our families wherever we be let us stand out and be proud to be a christian a seventh day adventist in this time for we have a message and i know lord that i wouldn't like anyone to write on the building why didn't you tell us you knew and you didn't say anything why Help us, Lord, to say what we need to say and you give us the words. We know that you can help us. And Lord, we pray for this week, through this coming week, that we will have something to bring back next Sabbath and tell how the Lord, how you have led in our life. So Lord, bless us, we pray. Bless this church. Bless the plans it has and all the members that have taken the responsibilities in the church here, as we read that today. And may your Holy Spirit always dwell here amongst each other that they love one another, and that's why people will see that they are truly Christians in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Whanarei. So, Lord, bless us now as we go our way in fellowship, we pray in Jesus' name.